a warm welcome to, to everyone on the webcast, taking time out of what is yet another busy period, uh, at least for us uh, here in emerging markets. Uh, we'll follow much the, the same um, uh, order of uh, running as, as usual. We'll give a review of uh, 2021, the year just gone by, and our returns uh, from then. Also, an update on the portfolio, what changes uh, we've made since our last update in, in November, and also go through a, a case uh, which has been in the portfolio for some time, uh, which is finally starting uh, to come through. And then finally, we'll, we'll touch obviously on, on the current tense situation in the market, talk a little bit about how we see the outlook for the year and period ahead. Uh, and touch a little bit on how the portfolio is set to navigate uh, some of the pressures that we're seeing in the market uh, today. Okay, so I think uh, if we look back to, to 2021, uh, it was a strong year for uh, investors. Most asset classes delivered attractive returns, in many cases well above what one would expect from a normal year. There I'm thinking in particularly about commodities, real estate, but also broad equities uh, delivered strong returns of, of close to 20% in US dollars. I think the way I would summarize the year is that it was a year of risk on. People took risk and it paid off uh, to take that risk last year. That's why on the right hand side that you can see that fixed income instruments and other more perceived safe havens such as cash and gold fared much worse than riskier assets. And if we go into equities as, as an asset class, there was as there tends to be a widespread of returns depending on which markets you were exposed to. Uh, at the top on, on the left hand side, you can see that again, the US was one of the stronger markets globally, uh, which meant that developed market as a whole were well ahead of emerging markets, which were down by 3% in US dollar terms. Within emerging markets, the principal uh, return drivers were those of Taiwan and India, which were both strong performers during the year, but the index as a whole was dragged down by what was a very weak Chinese equity market, down almost 25% from for the year. Uh, and as we highlighted in, in our last webinar, a lot of that sell-off came during the summer and the autumn as regulatory pressure on the internet sector, but also the education sector uh, started to be priced in by investors. Also, fears over weakness and contagion in, in the property market did play into the second half of the year. Um, I think for, for Contiki, uh, we were cautiously positioned in China at the start of the year. Uh, but we still underperformed the index. And that was due to a weakness in the Korean market, which you can see um, was down for the year. Uh, it was down about 4% in US dollar terms. And we also suffered uh, some unusually large drawdowns in the insurance company Ping'an and also Atlantic Sapphire, a land-based salmon farming company. You see in our top five, uh, you clearly see uh, that the strength in India also came through in our portfolio. Two of our top five contributors for the year, uh, agricultural crop protection company, UPL, and IT services company, Tech Mahindra. Uh, Tech Mahindra did very, very well. And also you can see the commodities part of the portfolio, both in terms of copper through Ivanhoe Mines, but also the Russian energy company, Luke Oil, uh, did it very well uh, last year. At the bottom half, it is unsurprisingly dominated by our Chinese exposure with three of the top five uh, negative contributors uh, based on Chinese holdings. Um, we went through Ping An in quite some detail in the last webinar where we uh, highlighted that we had been adding to the position and luckily the stock has started to recover a little bit of its losses from last year so far this year which we think is encouraging um, for that position. I think also if we put 2021 into context, um, it was a year where the relative underperformance of emerging markets vis-a-vis -vis developed markets was unusually large at 25 percentage point spread. 
if we look at the 20 near 20 year history of Skagen and Contiki, that's the second largest discrepancy in returns uh, since the fund came into existence. What's also uh, worth noting is that the first decade of the fund's operation, emerging market returns were consistently higher than they were in developed market, whereas the last 10 years, we have seen a cumulative underperformance of 50 percentage points between emerging markets and developed markets. So clearly a game of two halves in this context. That's also reflected in the fund's uh, performance since inception. In the first 10 years, it annualized about 18% in euro terms, whereas in the last 10 years, the returns have been more modest at 5% annualized, which is well below those of developed market uh, equities, um, which has clearly um, come uh, as one of the drivers for that is because the relative valuation of the emerging markets has been consistently coming down during that period and will return to why we think that offers opportunities at the moment. Despite the two, two periods of, of the fund's existence, has delivered 11% annualized returns, uh, which is uh, approximately three percentage points uh, above the MSCI emerging markets benchmark during the period. We delve into the portfolio and give a little bit more of an update um, just to refresh your memory and what Skagen Contiki offers. It is an actively managed value based unconstrained mandate that basically gives its showing in these three key characteristics. Number one, the fund maintains a significant active share of close to 90%. In part, that is driven by, as you can see on the right hand side, a pretty significant tilt towards small and mid cap capitalization companies, which accounts for about just over 50% of the portfolio versus 20% for the benchmark. In terms of the value characteristics, you can see that at the time of uh, our last update, the portfolio is now trading on seven times current year earnings which is an almost 40% discount to the benchmark and also at less than one times price to book, which is a 50% discount to the benchmark. Look, um, as we mentioned last time, uh, you know, we had a number of Chinese holdings that were either entered or increased during the course of 2021. There has been no real change in the last, uh, last since the last update in terms of which companies are in our top 12 holdings. Uh, but we did highlight last time both Ping'an and Sinuk, which were companies that we added to uh, in that period. And as you can see, we still see considerable upside, both those, both those uh, names well ahead of the weighted average 60% upside that we see in the portfolio on a two-year view. Um, also, uh, we mentioned uh, Russia. Um, it is a part of the portfolio. We have approximately eight and a half percent of the portfolio in Russia. It's relatively diversified exposure across consumer, financials and energy. And only one of those holdings, uh, Sparebank, is in our top 12. But as you can see, uh, based on our estimates, you know, a lot of um, uh, risk is taken into account into the current valuation, which for a company generating well over 20% annualized return on equity and trading on what just one times price to book and less than four times price earnings. We look at the uh, aggregate composition of the portfolio on a sector basis. It's a relatively balanced composition. I would draw your attention to two things. Number one, we have a relatively large overweight position in consumer sectors. That's both across discretionary and the more defensive staples exposure. And also we have maintained a large commodity exposure in the portfolio, uh, which in addition to our 6% uh, size in energy is made up of 18% in materials, especially in the copper segment, agricultural, uh, exposure and also battery technology. That is effectively funded by an underweight in IT, which has predominantly come from the fact that we sold out of Tech Mahindra 
during the course of last year. And our remaining IT exposure is, is mainly in the uh, memory uh, space uh, where our holding in Samsung Electronics is one of our uh, top holdings. We think that the outlook for the memory uh, industry still looks very good. It's a highly consolidated industry with some secular demand drivers uh, still trading at low multiples because of perceived cyclicality. When we look at country bases, uh, we mentioned both China last time and, and, and Russia this time. They are two of the most important countries in the portfolio. If you see in the top five countries, they account for almost 80% of the portfolio versus roughly two thirds of the benchmark. Uh, our largest overweight there uh, is in South Korea, where at 25% of the portfolio is double uh, that of the index. And again, I would stress that the allocation to South Korea is on a bottom up basis. Uh, we own global leading export companies. And we have relatively limited exposure to South Korean domestic um, economy. One thing I want to, to just highlight to you is the shift in the portfolio during the course of 2021. What we try and show on this graph, which on the X axis has the annual return for last year uh, and on the Y axis has a relative change in um, uh, weight versus the, the index. So basically what that means is that uh, in the top left hand corner, you have countries where the market return last year was negative, but we increased our relative weight versus the benchmark. And in the bottom right hand corner, you have market such as India that did very strongly last year, but where we actively sold into that strength and, and realized significant gains and therefore reduced our uh, relative weight versus the benchmark as that was floating up and we were selling. Uh, you may wonder uh, if there are other reasons for doing that. Uh, it was not a uh, rebalancing act. It's also because that's where we see opportunities. So here you see those same markets in terms of their PE multiples uh, at the end of January in the blue bars. So not only is India ex more expensive than other markets, there are very good reasons why India has historically traded at higher multiples than many other markets in emerging, uh, emerging markets. But as you can see in the green dots, it is more expensive relative to its own history. So that's the reason why on a bottom up basis, our stock picks, uh, as companies have reached our uh, estimates of fair value, we have recycled them into holdings that happen to be in countries that are trading not only at lower valuation multiples, but also relative to their own history, uh, which shows that we are using actively uh, the unconstrained mandate. A shift towards China during the course of 2021, um, we see that it's starting to pay off so far this year. Uh, at the end of uh, January, four of our top five contributors uh, were from China. As you can see here, year to date, two of the top three are the two companies that we mentioned in our last update. And in addition to that, we have Turkers Hill Resources, which is the mining company I will spend a little bit more time on. Uh, in terms of the negative contributors, they are largely from Russia, which I don't think is, is surprising, but also the Korean market has come under pressure this year, uh, largely in the uh, because of supply bottlenecks and rising input cost pressure on some of those very export businesses that we are focused on. Okay, so in previous uh, updates, we've talked about Ivanhoe Mines, which was one of our uh, main copper plays. Um, this uh, company is called Turquoise Hill Resources. It was actually previously known as Ivanhoe Mines. Um, that's a different story, uh, but it, it is basically the owner. It has 66% stake in the Oyo Tolgo mine, which is a copper and gold project in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, with the remainder of the mine owned by the government of Mongolia. The company is controlled by Rio Tinto, which also operates and develops um, the mine. Um, the company is already operating uh, its uh, open pit operations uh, and they are developing an underground uh, part of the mine as well. 
and this at the same time as Ivanhoe was weak in 28 on uh, weak commodity prices, uh, so was Turquoise Hill, and, and we entered the position at that uh, point. Uh, what happened since then is that the company ran into troubles with its underground development progress, and during the first year of our ownership, uh, it fell a 74 percent. Um, from our entry price, as you can see in the red part of, of the line. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's a company that we have engaged uh, extensively during this period. Uh, I traveled to the project back in October 2019, met with all the other stakeholders, including the government of Mongolia representatives um, and uh, project financing providers and other shareholders. This was to get a better understanding of what had gone wrong and, and what chance we had to recoup uh, our losses um, at the time. Now, the reason why we were invested in, in, in the company is that we see enormous fundamental upside if the project is delivered. That has not changed. Uh, as you can see here, this is a world class mine. It will be a top five producer uh, when the underground development project is completed and it would also be in the first quartile on the cost curve. Um, basically, when this, comp when this mine is generating 500,000 um, tons of uh, copper production uh, in 2026 to 2030, uh, we estimate that at current spot prices, you will have about $3 billion of annualized cash flow. The current market cap of the company is $4 billion US dollars. So the challenge with this uh, investment uh, was to do with the development of the underground uh, expansion project and the financing around that, not the fundamentals of the mine itself. One of the challenges here was that the government of Mongolia did not and could not put more money into the project, but wanted to retain their 34% ownership stake. Um, and as you can see here as well, just to put things into to context, Ivanhoe Mines, uh, which has been a very successful uh, investment for the fund, uh, will be the uh, second largest uh, producing mine in the world. So what has happened that makes me want to bring it up now? Well, it has been a challenging period for, for the company last year, um, there was a proposal to write off shareholder loans provided to the Mongolian government for its share of the development spend to date. The reason why this is challenging is that this is Turquoise Hill shareholder money. Uh, part of it is, is our money that has been lent out. And what this would mean is that you're effectively taking 100% of the cost for 60%, 66% of the value of the project. Now, the deal was signed in January this year. Uh, so although we've had to forego a large share of the development costs incurred to date, we think it's a good deal uh, for all uh, stakeholders in, in the project. It means that we can now go ahead. Uh, the uh, blasting ceremony took uh, place uh, earlier this year. And as you can see in the share price chart on the right hand side, the shares have more than recouped their losses during this period, partly on the back of strong uh, commodity prices, both for copper and for gold, but also because the market is becoming increasingly comfortable with the delivery of the project and can now look at the fundamentals of it rather than near term concerns around financing options. To look into the, the outlook and, and how we are positioned, I think, you know, we see a lot of headlines at the moment. Is this a correction? Newspapers or um, Publications like to speculate and always want to be the ones who call the, the top. Um, we don't engage uh, in that. We think it always pays to have a diversified portfolio uh, and to be focused on, on valuations. But in terms of what the market is concerned with at the moment, it's clear that high inflation, rising interest rates, high valuations and debt loads across the world is what has got people relatively nervous at the moment. So we want to address those as well as some of the geopolitical tensions that is shaking the markets at the moment. So if we start with, with inflation, here you have the US CPI uh, in the blue line, and in the green line, you have the, the Fed uh, fund rate. 
what what's important to note here is that we are at the largest negative spread in this 50 year time series in front of you. Um, this is why the market is increasingly thinking and saying that uh, the rates need to go up. They need to go up materially and they need to go up quickly. What are the drivers of this inflation levels? A lot of it is to do with post COVID effects in the economy. Firstly, uh, the strong demand recovery, particularly for physical goods in the US, uh, has not been met from the supply side. We see several shortages across the world, particularly in areas related to semiconductors, uh, with the auto sector being, I think, the most prominent example. That's leading to higher prices. It's leading to longer lead times. And when we are seeing on top of that labor shortages, that has also a spillover to logistics uh, chains. Um, we do see that the lack of deliveries is exacerbating the pressure on prices. Also, as we've talked about in, in previous updates, uh, energy costs are going up. That's partly driven by the energy transition, which we believe is inflationary, predominant in the metals uh, required to deliver electrification, but also the long term rising cost of capital for legacy energy systems such as oil and natural gas has led to underinvestment. And when you've had a sharp uh, demand recovery, as we've had in recent months and no supply uh, response to it, prices have had to come up significantly. Now, the question obviously is how high do interest rates need to go in order to dampen some of these pressures and avoid that inflation expectations are set for longer and also lead to spiraling wage demands. But before we jump into that, I just wanted to say it is worth just taking a time to, to think back just two and a half years ago. None of these none of these things were on people's minds. Inflation was declared dead by Bloomberg Business Week uh, because of demographic changes, because of technology uh, that was advancing. And, you know, the fact that high debt burdens meant that interest rates simply could not uh, go up. So I think what we've seen in the last two years with a combination of incredible monetary and fiscal stimulus across the world uh, does seem to have changed the market dynamics for a while. When you look at the US 10 year yield, um, it is clear that in this time frame there has been a change in uh, interest rates. So 0.6% to just over 2% is, is a trebling of what we would deem to be the most important interest rate in the world. Um, and that is being used uh, by most as, a, as an explanation as to why the equity markets have sold off at the start of this year. But the question for us is, is this the right way to look at it? And we think maybe not, because again, if we if we zoom out a little bit and take an annual snapshot once a year of where the 10 year rate has been over the last decade. And if we just take out this recent two year period where there has been much more of that volatility, you can see that the 10 year US government yield has been plus minus 20 basis points around its, its median level. And in the same time, you've had almost 14% annualized euro returns in global equities during that period. Yes, there has been some volatility, but ultimately um, there has been a huge amount of shareholder returns delivered uh, and there have been stable interest rates uh, for the most part during that period. So what I would contend is that you know, it's the value creation in the companies that we own that is driving this shareholder return over time. Now, the share prices may not reflect it on a day to day basis or even a month to month basis uh, exactly what uh, is happening within these companies. But what we're seeing today in terms of interest rates, in terms of nervousness, I think is more a search for an explanation as to why things are moving in short term time horizons and forgets to look at the long term driver of returns in the market, which ultimately are reflected in the returns from the market. So here again, we would stress the need for a long term perspective and is exactly why we continue to be focused on how our companies make money and how much we pay for that future income stream. The other concern at the moment, of course, is to do with geopolitics. 
Um, this year it's Russia. Last year was China in terms of tech clampdown and uh, and um, property market. In 2018-19, it was it was the trade war. Uh, this is not to try and brush aside any of these concerns that the market has today, other than to say that uh, geopolitical events do explain a lot of short-term movements, particularly to do with um, nervousness in the market. Uh, we don't have any particularly insight as to what will happen on the Russian-Ukraine border. Uh, it's clear to us that, you know, and conflict is not in anyone's interest, um, at least not from a financial investor perspective. Uh, but what we would stress is that the market has a tendency to look at these things in a forward-looking manner. And the correction that started in Russian equities did not start this year as the headlines were building. It started already back in October, November uh, last year. Now, there is clear downside risk in the short term if the situation escalates. As I mentioned, 8.5% of our portfolio is in Russian equities. We have a relatively good idea of what we think are the uh, scenarios and the outcomes for those equities in different um, if different things happen. But ultimately, we believe that given the, the drawdown that has already been, uh, it is um, a risk that we are being compensated for, at least if things do not escalate further. And to put things into co context, I mentioned that Russian equities had fallen already since October last year. They had fallen by approximately 25%. And here we put into context in the same way that we did with China last year, the drawdown. So from any peak in any given year, what's the maximum drawdown during that year? And the two things to take away from, from this chart is, number one, every year in Russia, just as it did in China, has a big uh, draw, drawdown. On average, the uh, drawdown is approximately 30%. And number two, the drawdown that we've had already is in line with that historical pattern, uh, which means that there is already a significant amount of bad news priced into it. And that's also what we, we look at when we look at the valuations of the companies that we are invested in. I said that less than four times earnings for Sparebank, one times price to book for 22% return on equity, gives you an indication of what the risk premium uh, is already. Uh, priced in there. The second thing to, to bear in mind in terms of valuation is that there are indirect beneficiary uh, in Russia, particularly from higher commodity prices. I mentioned earlier that our holding in Lukoil last year performed very, very strongly uh, as the oil price um, reached uh, new highs. And it's also worth bearing in mind um, that you know, at one point, 2022 will also be in the past, just like 2021 and the China drawdown last year is now in the past. Past declines always look like an opportunity for long-term investors. Um, as I said earlier, the value creation in the companies that we are invested in is what drives value over time. Short-term fluctuations due to the prices paid for those earnings streams is something that we can't control. Obviously, when you're in the middle of it, any kind of decline uh, when it's ongoing feels uh, like a very, very high risk. Uh, but um, once we have more clarity and the situation uh, is no longer so uncertain, I'm sure that the risk premium again will start to, to normalize. Then I think you need to look at uh, valuation in context. So we get a lot of questions if the market is expensive. Well, the market is many things to many people. So I would say that how you answer that question depends on, on where you look. Talked a lot about Russia, which is now uh, you know, one of the by far cheapest markets in the world at the moment. It's trading on uh, less than six times earnings. So it's hard to say that that is expensive from a fundamental perspective, although it can clearly get cheaper if the situation gets worse. Uh, if you look at the other end of the scale, um, markets that have done well for long periods of time, be it the US or, or India, they do look expensive relative to other markets, but also relative uh, to their own history. 
And for us, focused on, on emerging markets, um, we do think that the emerging markets screen very attractively compared to other parts of the world. As you can see on the, the chart, um, the EM uh, discount versus developed market is about 40%. And when we've put together the portfolio of Contiki, as, as I showed earlier in terms of country, in terms of sector exposure, we're not taking uh, undue risk relative to uh, the wider benchmark. But despite that, we have a portfolio trading on very, very attractive multiples relative to most of the markets that you could otherwise invest in. So how have we have been able to put together a portfolio of these valuations? Um, then there are two key drivers of it uh, at the aggregate level. Uh, one is, as I mentioned, the emerging markets discount relative to developed markets. That has widened considerably in the 10 year period where I mentioned that EM returns have been relatively weak. On a price to book basis, the discount is now 40%. On a price to earnings basis, the discount is a third. And you only need to go back those 10 years and the discount was uh, approximately 10% on those two metrics combined. The second part of the valuation attractiveness is driven by the long expansion in uh, value stocks discount to growth stocks. Uh, so here we show in a blue on the PE basis and on green on the price to book basis that so-called value stocks are now trading at a roughly 60% discount to their growth equivalents. And that compares with 40% um, discount uh, 10 years ago. So, of course, we know that companies that are delivering consistent growth, high returns on equity, they do deserve to trade at a premium. But it's clear that in, in the last decade, that premium has expanded significantly. And what is interesting is that in this period of rising inflation, rising interest rates, then current earnings do become increasingly attractive on a relative basis. And in fact, as we've seen in the energy segment, you know, already fully invested assets where suddenly there is a high improvement in the pricing for those commodities can drive a significant amount of earnings growth and a significant amount of shareholder return. So actually many of these value companies are now delivering far higher earnings growth than their so-called growth uh, peers. I just want to also show that across the portfolio, we are not sort of putting all eggs in one basket. You know, roughly half of the portfolio, so 45%, is in sectors related to energy, financials, commodities. These are the types of sectors that I talked about that tend to do better with inflation. Some of them do better when uh, economic growth is accelerating and some of them are, are more defensive. But what they have in common is that um, with the kind of environment that we're seeing today, they should see accelerating earnings growth relative to their history because of inflationary forces. Now, the other half of the portfolio, so roughly 55%, is more focused on consumption, services, internet and technology. You can see all the companies there uh, on the chart. These are companies that have historically delivered better uh, and more consistent growth. They have historically been valued more highly than the types of companies on the right hand side. So we still find plenty of opportunities in these types of sectors if we look closely enough in some of the smaller markets or maybe those that have come out of favor for, for other reasons. So the key message here is that from portfolio construction perspective, the valuation discount in the portfolio is not driven by some significant tilt in the portfolio, but it's driven by finding attractive bottom up companies where we see a fundamental reason why these individual stocks uh, should re-rate valuation wise. That means that we're not taking some giant bet that inflation will not be transitory or that interest rates will be a certain level versus another. We are positioned uh, adequately in both camps. So in terms of, of summary, uh, you know, there is no change to, to, to the fund. We are uh, an actively managed global emerging markets fund with a very long term time horizon. We have a clear value based investment philosophy where you can see that the valuation multiples 
of the markets we operate in, but also the portfolio itself is well above those discounts that we historically have seen. The portfolio uh, is concentrated uh, in terms of number of holdings at roughly 45 companies, but it's balanced across sectors, countries, uh, and themes. What the company, the portfolio companies have in common is that they are all significantly undervalued in our view. Uh, often that is because they are either in unpopular parts of the market, uh, or there is uh, something going on in terms of geopolitical events or cyclical events that means that people are unwilling to pay a fair price for the future income stream. And I think in terms of historical perspective, EM equities do offer attractive risk reward and portfolio diversification if you are concerned by high valuation levels in other markets or in other uh, uh, countries. Uh, and I think that as we showed during the drawdown in China last year, we do believe that an uncertain macro geopolitical backdrop does present opportunities for contrarian positioning through active stock picking uh, if you have the flexibility and the mandate to, to do that, which luckily Skagen Kamsiki does. So with that, I, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hopefully there were some new uh, companies or uh, or ideas you could take away from it. And if there are any follow up questions, I'd be happy to take those. If not, we wish you a, a great uh, afternoon and uh, and uh, good luck.